The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the Son of David. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off and he shall speak peace to the nations. The peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Most merciful God, as the people of Jerusalem with palms in their hands gathered to greet your dearly beloved son when he came into his holy city, Grant that we may ever hail him as our king, and when he comes again, may go forth to meet him with a trusting and steadfast hearts, and follow him in the way that leads to eternal life. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Holy Gospel for Palm Sunday, according to St. Mark in the 11th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it and we'll send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at the door outside the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches when they, that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Let us go forth in peace. In the name of the Lord, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Beloved in the Lord. Oh, first of all, you may be seated. Our Lord Jesus Christ said to his apostles, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. You have been baptized and catechized in the Christian faith according to our Lord's bidding. Jesus said, whoever confesses me before men, I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven, but whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. So lift up your hearts, therefore, to the God of all grace, and joyfully give answer to what I now ask you in the name of the Lord. Do you this day, in the presence of God and this congregation, acknowledge the gifts that God gave you in your baptism, then answer, yes, I do. Yes, I do. do you renounce the devil? Then answer, yes, I renounce him. Yes, I renounce him. 
Do you renounce all his works? Then answer, yes, I renounce them. Do you renounce all his ways? Then answer, yes, I renounce them. Do you believe in God the Father Almighty? Yes, I believe in God the Father. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord? Yes. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? Yes, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Do you hold all the prophetic and apostolic scriptures to be the inspired word of God? Then answer, I do. Do you confess the doctrine of the Evangelical Lutheran Church drawn from the scriptures, as you have learned to know it from the small catechism, to be faithful and true? Then answer, I do. Do you intend to hear the word of God and to receive the Lord's Supper faithfully? Then answer, I do by the grace of God. I do by the grace of God. Do you intend to live according to the word of God and in faith, word, and deed remain true to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, even to death? Then answer, I do by the grace of God. Do you intend to continue steadfast in this confession in church and to suffer all, even death, rather than fall away from it? Then answer, I do by the grace of God. And we rejoice with thankful hearts that you have been baptized and have received the teaching of the Lord. You have confessed the faith and absolved, been absolved of your sins. So as you continue to hear the Lord's word and receive his blessed sacrament, he who has begun a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. And so, invite Reagan Marie Dunkman. Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Joshua 1.9. The Lord bless you with a true courage and, and, and insight so that you can serve him in plentiful places and give grace and glory to him every day of your life. Amen. Joshua Nelson Pender. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I will keep it to the end. Psalm 119, 33. May the Lord bless you with a faith that is willing and able to fulfill your verse, to be continually looking to the word and learning from it throughout your days, so that you will keep it to the end. Amen. And so we pray. You can come back here. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for your great goodness in bringing these your son and daughter, Joshua and Rachel, to the knowledge of your son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and enabling them both to believe and confess their faith and the true faith. We thank you that their parents fed the faith that was planted in them when they were baptized. Grant that the planting and the roots that have sprouted since then will grow and continue to bring forth the fruits of faith. Grant that they may branch out by seeking and speaking the truth, bear fruit with acts of love and compassion, and stand strong in the face of hardship and opposition. May the promises of their baptism be renewed daily through contrition and repentance, so the old Adam will be weakened, drowned, and die. May the new man be nourished and strengthened each time they receive the Lord's Supper. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
mighty and everlasting God, you sent your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, to take upon himself our flesh and to suffer death upon the cross. Mercifully grant that we may follow the example of his great humility and patience and be made partakers of his resurrection through the same Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Traditionally, this Sunday was always Palm Sunday, and then in more recent times, it has also been called the Sunday of the Passion. And so uh, we make that connection and that transition now with this period of silence from looking at the Palm Sunday account from the Gospel of Mark and now the, the Passion account from the Gospel of Mark. The Passion of our Lord from the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark in the 15th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Please rise for the reading. And as soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered, you have said so. And the chief priests accused him of many things. And Pilate again asked him, Have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the feast, he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder and insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them, saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have them release for them Barabbas instead. And, and Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the man you call king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole battalion, and they clothed them in a purple cloak, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him. And they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews. And they were striking his head with the reed and spitting on him and, and kneeling down in the homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him and of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. And they led him out to crucify him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We confess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The epistle reading for today, Palm Sunday, is taken from Paul's letter to the church at Philippi, the second chapter. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, 
who, though he was in form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, throughout this Lenten season, we have been looking at Psalm 80 and applying the meaning of the kind of agricultural language that it uses in terms of of planting and shoots being shot out and branching out and bearing fruit and those kinds of things. And, And as we have looked at that, we have applied them to our lives because in the same way that God had planted his people throughout the history of mankind in various places in order to to branch out with his word and his truth, God has planted us here in this place to do the very same thing. And so today we're going to take another brief look at one of the verses from the psalm, Psalm 80, verse 2, that reads... Before Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh, stir up your might and come to save us. This is a perfect Palm Sunday Bible passage because the psalmist's prayer, the Lord, come save us, is is the prayer, the very same prayer, that the pilgrims in Jerusalem were saying when they followed Jesus in and the others who heard about Jesus coming came out to meet him and then when they sang their hosannas, the word hosanna means the Lord saved. Lord save us. Lord save us now. The very same prayer that was being prayed back when, the, the, when Psalm 80 was composed. And it had been sung over and over again amongst all kinds of people at different times. Now, when the pilgrims in Jerusalem were singing this, they were actually quoting Psalm 118. And Psalm 118 and Psalm 80 were written at two different times, but that's significant. Because this is a prayer that God's people had prayed over and over and over again when they were facing all kinds of challenges, oftentimes of their own doing. Because of their own sinful nature, they had turned away from the Lord. And when they found themselves turned away from the Lord and, and, and dealing with the, all the kinds of hardships on account of it, they would turn back to the Lord and say, Lord, save us. Likewise, even during the faithful times, they would still pray this prayer, save us now. And that's what the people in Jerusalem were praying when Jesus came in. Only it was different this time. This time as Jesus came in, this was a fulfillment of promises, of prophecies that had been given in the scriptures that are very, very important and very clear and explicit to say that we're not just praying that somehow God is going to take care of us, but we want God to send his promised Messiah, the one, the anointed one, who would come to to free us as the scriptures had told them in the Hebrew Bible. And today's Old Testament lesson is one of those scriptures. I want to read it to you again. This was proof positive, proof positive that Jesus is the King, the Messiah, who was promised, even though there were people who didn't want to believe it. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your King is coming to you righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore to you double. 
This is an uncanny verse when you look at it. Not only is it talking about the fact that Jesus would be riding in on this donkey, the colt, the foal of a donkey, but it also gives us the whole picture of what Jesus was coming for. Now in Psalm 80, when, it, when the prayer goes out for the Lord to, to show his might with Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh, which would have been the, the nations that bordered the northern part, Benjamin, or Manasseh and Ephraim, and then in the middle near Jerusalem was, was the tribe of Benjamin. And, and, and here in Psalm 80, the, the psalmist is looking for a, a campaign to, to deliver them in a forceful way. But now in Zechariah, it's saying, no, that's not what it's all about. That the Lord will come, the Messiah will come to bring peace to his people. And that that peace will come about by a covenant that has been established by blood, by Jesus suffering and bleeding on a cross for the sins of the whole world and not just for his people here. And that this wasn't just for those people, but it was for people throughout the world. And he gives the boundaries, first of all, saying from the, the great sea, the Mediterranean Sea, to the river, would have been Jer the Jordan River. But then it says, to the very ends of the earth. This promise that God had made, this coming together and this coming into God's city in Jerusalem was for all peoples. It's amazing how Zechariah mentions the colt that Jesus would ride. It wasn't a war horse. It wasn't something that they would have expected from a, a general or a king to come in in order to do battle. But it was a way of showing his humility, the same humility we heard about in Philippians chapter 2 today. And a lot of people would look at this and, and, and see this as an uncanny prophecy that is fulfilled very specifically and very clearly. And some people would say, oh, well, that's nothing. He just went in and found someone to, to give him a colt. I mean, anybody could have done that. But this is just one of about 300 prophecies that are fulfilled. This is really the, the strength of our, our faith and our trust in God's word is built on the prophecies that had been given over this 1,500-year period that were, now, that were being fulfilled then and were, are continuing to be fulfilled in our lives as well. It gives us hope, it gives us strength. And some people, as they look at this and kind of try to shove that off, but the fact is, is that not only did Jesus ride in on the colt, as he said, and as Zechariah had said, but then just two chapters later, it talks about the 30 pieces of silver that Judas would receive to betray Jesus. The next chapter talks about Jesus being pierced by the soldier. The next chapter talks about Jesus, the shepherd, being smitten, being killed. With all of those prophecies being fulfilled in such an uncanny way. Some of them, uh, a, a mortal person could have gone and got a donkey. But a mortal person could not have somehow put together this betrayal and the death and the piercing of his opposition. When you look at all of those things, and, 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 and theologians have talked about Zechariah as the prophet of Holy Week. It is so clear and so powerful that, it's, that no false prophet, no false Messiah could possibly have fulfilled this or the hundreds of other prophecies that we find in the scriptures. And as we look at that, uh, I, I can't help but think that there are people who are looking at, at Christianity these days and, and questioning and are skeptical about those things. In fact, last week, there was an article that was produced by an organization called the Barna Group, and it was called 2015 State of Atheism in America. What researchers had done is they, they studied unchurched people for a full year and made some very interesting conclusions and, and, and found out some interesting facts as a result of it. They made a distinction between people who were skeptics and they kind of lumped together atheists who deny that there's a God and agnostics who are not sure into one group and found that that was about a quarter of the people who were these unchurched people in America. 
And by unchurched, by their definition, they meant someone who was not in church in the last six months. But the vast majority of them were people who were unchurched, but were simply non-practicing Christians. See, a third of those skeptics had never, ever been in a church in their lives. But that means the vast majority of them were people who had been in church and had turned away. This Palm Sunday, this Confirmation Sunday, is a good day to talk about that trend and to talk about what we can do about it. Especially as we remember and and, and celebrate with with Josh and Reagan. Because we can do that through our adult information classes, and we had a couple adult members brought in today, and, and through our junior confirmation, through our Bible classes, through our preaching and teaching, but also in the way that we relate to one another as a church, how we, the kind of activities we do, and the way we stand firm and stand strong on the truth of God's word. Because here's the problem that Barna Research had identified. They discovered three components of disbelief, three things that were char- common, uh, characteristically common to these unchurched folks. One was a rejection of the Bible. And two was a lack of trust in local congregations. And three, there was a cultural reinforcement of a secular worldview over and against a biblical worldview. And I find that kind of fascinating because when I look at what was happening when Jesus made his triumphal entry, it was the very same things. The fact is, is that Jesus had been teaching the word in a way that people were denying. And that people had come to question, and, and, and not only Jesus and his disciples, but even the church that was operating at that time amongst the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Sanhedrin there. People didn't like what, the way they were being treated. It was undermining faith in the one true God. And the fact is, is that there was a worldview, a secular worldview that was coming at them from Rome that was affecting those same people in the same way that affects us. So much so that even the the church leaders, the Pharisees and the scribes, at a point say, we have no king but Caesar. They denied all of the texts, including the Zechariah texts, and all of the places that speak about a coming king, a coming Messiah, and said, we have no king but Caesar because of the pressure from a worldview that was, uh, that was fighting against them. And the same thing can be tr- said for our culture and our society today. But the thing that I also find fascinating is those three things are the very same three things that, that we point out and that we hold to as we talk about our vision statement here. That we are a church that is branching out by speaking the word of God in our worship services and then to other people in Bible classes and, and in our relationships with family, friends, and coworkers. That we as a church need to be bearing fruit, helping people out, doing acts of kindness and compassion for folks. And that three, we as a church need to be standing strong, standing firm, letting those roots sink in so that we will not be pushed and broken by a worldview that is opposing us these days. As we look at those things and see what the Bible is teaching and then hold fast to the truths of that scripture based on the fulfillment of prophecies, based on the historical evidence, based on the archeological evidence, based on the fact that it makes sense of every situation that we deal with these days. You see, the skeptics just look at the Bible and think of it as just a kind of a a storybook of familiar stories to them and a whole bunch of rules of laws and do's and don'ts. And I wish you could have been here, all of you could have been here on Friday night because during our confirmation questioning, and it was a little different than what we'd ever done before. Reagan and Joshua and I sat at a card table here, and I played a role of someone who would have been skeptical, someone who didn't really know much about the Bible, and they did such a beautiful job of explaining why the Bible is different than any other book, of explaining the fact that if you want to understand the Bible, You need to understand who Jesus is because it's all pointing to Jesus. 
All of those prophecies, all of those promises from the Old Testament on, the Hebrew Bible, were pointing forward to a Jesus who would come. And then all of the New Testament is pointing back to the Jesus who has come. It's all about Jesus. And certainly there are words of law, there are rules there, but there are also these wonderful gospel promises that Jesus fulfilled for us that give us hope. A hope that we would be received out of the the waterless pit, as they say. A hope that sets prisoners free from the waterless pit to return to our stronghold. We are no longer prisoners of the law, but we are prisoners and servants of hope. It was, it, was, it was wonderful the way they were able to do that so well. And it's something that I, I, I know that uh, even that very same day, Josh was on the, on the bus, a school bus, and there was a, uh, a young guy who was near him and, and started asking some religious questions. And right away, Josh had everything that he needed to be able to respond to those questions. That's the kind of thing that we need, all of us, to be able to hold fast to that truth, to those promises and to be victorious in the end. Because, see, that's what this is all about. It's interesting. These palm branches that we bring, you know, people wonder, well, why do we do that? Was that just a tradition that has been passed along through the ages? But there's something significant about these palm branches. In every, in the history of mankind, with every major people group, from the time that Abram was in the Chaldees, and those Mesopotamian religions, they looked at palm branches as a sign of victory of triumph. And when the Israelites were in Egypt, Egypt, the Egyptians, looked at palm branches as a sign of triumph. Later on, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, looked at palm branches in this very same way. The Greeks used palm branches on their coinage and and on their art because it was a sign of victory and triumph. The Romans did the same. So when Jesus went in and came into Jerusalem and the, and the children and the people began to, to wave those palm branches. It wasn't just because that's what they had on hand. It wasn't just because they thought it would be pretty. But they were giving a message that this was a sign of the victory that they would have through the coming of their Messiah, their promised one. And so as we hand these palm branches out for you to take home, I hope that you use those as a reminder because it is a reminder to us of the victory that we have over our sinful flesh and over death and the devil through Jesus Christ, our Messiah and King. Those palm branches are intended to remind us that we have a victory through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. May the peace of God that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We, were... we do rejoice that all of you could be here for this worship service to celebrate God's love for us and also uh, to celebrate Reagan and Josh's confirmation. We hope that you can come back and, and worship with us again. Uh, if you happen to get a newsletter, all the details of our services are there. But uh, Monday, Thursday, this Thursday, a service at 7 o'clock that will include a stripping of the altar and foot washing and then... Good Friday is our tenebrae service, a service of darkness there. Uh, And then Easter Sunday, we have services at 8 and 10.30, and then there's a breakfast in between down at school that will be going from 9 until 10. And so certainly welcome to be a part of of all of those services. We encourage you to be at all of them. They they continue to build on this theme that we have been developing throughout the season. On Saturday, there's also an Easter egg hunt uh, down at school that starts at 10 a.m., and that's for, you know, Uh, little preschoolers on up to fifth grade and then our sixth, seventh, and eighth graders are going to be kind of hosting that and and running all the games and we always have a lot of fun with that as well. So you're you're certainly welcome to to bring, you know, family, friends, people, anybody that you know to to come and be a part of that as well. Um, As you leave today, there's a couple things. One, you'll receive a a palm frond and we encourage you to take that and, and remember what it means for us. Also on your way out too, uh, there are, you can still order flowers to help adorn the the chancel during our Easter celebrations. And so we encourage folks to do that. It's always, uh, the more flowers, the more beautiful it is. We always uh, appreciate people's generosity there. And then also uh, encourage people to take a look at the photos that are available um, in the entryway and uh, continue to support the Broker family through those and uh, and receive a, a beautiful picture of the church as well. Are there any other announcements that need to be made? Okay.
We'll be taking some pictures up here, but at first uh, I'm going to give Josh and Reagan a, a chance to, to greet people in the entryway with us. As we, uh, and, and, and while we do that, we also encourage all of you to extend God's peace to the people who are sitting near you. God's peace be with you.